Have you ever felt like you blew it so badly that was no way that God could ever forgive you? Maybe you have made a mistake or fallen into sin and now feel like that you are beyond redemption. If that's you this morning, I came to bring you good news today. That our God is a God of the second chance. Now, if we're truthful this morning, every one of us at one time and another have made mistakes, we've stumbled, we've fallen, we found ourselves lost in the darkness of our transgressions. But even in our lowest moment, grace stepped right in. And the light of God shines so brightly, offering us hope and redemption while giving us a second chance. In 1 John chapter 1, Starting at the fifth verse, the Apostle John is writing a letter to the church, which means the believers. He's bringing their attention to the forgiveness that we have access to as the believers of God. First John chapter 1, starting at the fifth verse, it says this. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and we do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is the light, we have fellowship with one another. The blood of Jesus, his sons, purify us from all of our sins. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim to be without sin, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. I wanna take the next few moments and talk to you from the subject that God is a God of the second chance. See, when we look at this text, this text really reveals the heart of God, who is always ready to forgive and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. But before we can really appreciate the concept of a second chance, we must first acknowledge the reality of sin, that sin exists. The Bible tells us that Adam sinned and sinned into the world and Adam sin brought death. So death spread it to everyone for everyone sin. For we are born with a sin nature. We inherit it from Adam, which was the first man for the Bible students here. Romans chapter 3, verses 23 says this, I tell you this, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. See, my Bible tells me that none of us are exempt from sin gripping us or sin hold on us. The reality is that we must confront that sin exists and sin is always warring, trying to have victory over us. So what is sin? Sin is diverting from oh, the obedience of God and his character and God's will. It literally is diverting from what God tells us to do that is true. When we look at the scriptures, sin is described as transgressions against the laws of God. 
It is rebellion against God. So sin is the thing that separates us from God and breaks our fellowship with God. That is why Jesus came, so that we could be restored back to the Father, that we could have um, dominion over our sin. It is Jesus Christ that broke the power of sin in our lives. In verse 6 of our text, it says, if we claim to have fellowship with God, we walk in darkness. He says, you are a lie. In other words, he's saying what he's telling us that if we are continuously saying that we are not without sin, we're lying. When the Bible tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. See, the fellowship with God is not validated by our lips, but it's validated by our walks. Can you walk the walk and not just do the talking? See, it's good to praise him and to shout amen and to give God's thank. All of those things have their place, but the intimacy with God must be demonstrated through our actions and not just mere, merely through our vocabulary. We have become comfortable praising him with our lips and our members doing something else. But the Bible tells us if we have fellowship with God and we will have fellowship with fellow believers and we will walk in the light. He says if you have fellowship with God, you're going to walk in the light. Why are you going to walk in the light? Because he is the light. And in him there is no darkness. Only God is light. And he's calling us to walk in the light. And we must be willing as believers to let God expose the sin in our life. That's what John was telling the church. John was telling the church, listen church, but you are not without sin. But you got to be willing to cooperate and let God expose the areas in your life where you are walking in darkness. See, those that walk in the light are, are not sinless, but, it, it, but when we walk in the light, what happens is that it, it, the light enables us to see our sins so that we can repent. See, the light shines into the darkness. We're able to see so that we can repent. There are times that we walk this life and we're thinking that we're doing the right thing. Thing. The Bible says that the heart of a man or woman is deceitfully wicked. What does that tell me? That our heart can deceive us. There are times that we're thinking that we're doing the right thing and, now, and well, we're doing the wrong thing. And now we're living in a day where people are calling wrong, right, and right, wrong. But he's calling the believers to walk in the light. And when we begin to repent of our sins, that we repent and we ask Jesus uh, uh, for forgiveness in our life, Jesus comes in and he cleanses us. And then so that we can grow in sanctification and spiritual maturity and begin to have that intimacy with the Lord. See, God has a standard just in case you didn't know. He has a standard of living. He has an expectation of the way he expects for you to walk your life out. He wants you to look like him and to talk like him. He wants you to act like him day in and day out. And the more, the more you get closer to God and the light of Jesus Christ shines in the darkness of our lives, when we confess and we repent, then Jesus can come in and transform us. 
See, we are holy people. When holy people themselves live in the light of God, we begin to see the dirt. And when we begin to see the dirt, we begin to see the darkness, we begin to see the spots, we begin to see the wrinkles. When we begin to see those things and we desire to want God to deal with it, that's the key, to want him to deal with it, it is something that God delights in doing. Why? Because God wants you to become more like him each and every day. And only then can we live fully exposed to the truth of God and his ongoing cleansing work of the blood of Jesus, which is activated in our life. See, it's the blood that activated it in our lives. So it is through the blood that it is revealed. It is through the blood we have the cleansing through Jesus Christ. And it empowers us to address the sin that God has exposed that he had brought light to in our life. See, what I'm trying to tell you this morning, you are not defeated by your sins. Jesus Christ has already defeated your sins on the cross. All you have to do is get alignment with him. When the spirit of the Lord exposes and he shows an area in your life, just be willing to say, God, deal with it, deal with it, deal with it, deal with it, God. I don't want it no more. I don't want to live this way. There are times when you are growing growing and maturing in the things of God. And when you would find out that, God, I didn't know that there was some hate on the inside of me. God, I don't know. I didn't think that there was some unforgiveness in my heart. I didn't think I had some bitterness in my heart, God. There are some things that God begins to show you that you have to deal with. But we got to allow him to have access in our lives. And see, when we fellowship with God, we can, God can begin to move on our lives when we fellowship. See, the closer we get to him, the more the light comes on. Okay? See, when you got saved and you gave your life to Jesus Christ, huh? all of you didn't just get right. I know you thought it did. I know you thought you got saved and everything's going to be all right. You wouldn't have to do nothing else now that I'm saved. Uh, God has already paid the price on the cross for me. He's already called me sanctified. He's already called me righteous. Yes, he's already called you all of that. He's already said, this is who you are. But now he says, come on, let's be it. Let's do the walk. Let's do the walk. Walk it out day in and day out. He has an expectation. For us to transform. He has an expectation for us not to be the same. You shouldn't be the same person today that you was 10 years ago. If you've been in the way and nothing has changed in your life, that means you've just been in the way. Ain't nothing changed in your life. Things ought to be changing. Things ought to be falling off. Chains ought to be broken in your life. Things that used to move you in the past or should not move you anymore. And then how are we going to know whether we are maturing in our life? When God brings challenges in our life, we find out, wait a minute, back then, before B.C., before Christ, if this would have happened, I would have did this. But now you see that I, you begin to call on the name of the Lord. You know that you're being transformed into the likeness, into the image of Christ, that God is doing his perfecting work on the inside of you you. Transformation is taking place. So church, we got to stop making excuses for our sin. We got to stop making excuses for the things that we do. We do what we do because we want to do it. The Bible says if we fail to allow God's word to dominate our life as a believer, then we deceive ourselves. 
And then we begin to deny that we're not in the state of sin. And sin does not exist in our life. It says when you do that, you deceive yourself. You might not be deceiving everybody else, but when you deny that there is sin in your life, you begin to deceive yourself. See, our best day, we fall short of God's holy standard, but God still tells us to be holy, to pursue after it. See, our, our sanctification, he tells us we ought to pursue it. I'm about to get to the good part. I know I told you that he was a God of a second chance. But see, I can't just run to the text. I got to give it to you in context of what God is saying to us. So he's saying to us. That we got to deal with this sin nature that's going on in our lives. But thanks be to God who has given us the victory. What he's saying, despite your sinfulness, God still offers us forgiveness. That ought to be enough for somebody to run around this room. Oh, yes. Yeah. See, John assured us. He says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you. See, God promised to forgive us. It's not based on merit. It's not based on worthiness, but it's based on God's character. I'm so glad it's based on his character. I'm so glad it ain't based on me, whether what I do and what I don't do, but it's based on the character of God. He is faithful to his promises. He is just to forgive us because of us being sanctified through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. When Jesus went to that cross and when he took his last breath, he said, it is finished. It is over. Not only did he get victory over death, but he got victory over sin too in our lives. But we got to trust it and believe it. But in order for us to receive the forgiveness of God, we must first confess our sins. We got to confess. It's conditional. The Bible tells us we got to confess our faults, confess our sins to the Lord. Confession involves acknowledging our wrongdoing and taking responsibility for our actions and turning away from our sins. When we confess our sins to God, we are agreeing with what God's word has revealed about us. We are agreeing with him. We're saying, God, you're right. We are admitting that the light has exposed, that we exposed us. And it's not just a mistake. It's not just a bad habit or a meal product of our upbringing, but it is sin in our lives. When we begin to agree with God, it literally means that we are saying the same thing as God about our sins. You're getting an agreement with him. See, God, you said it, I, I'm not going to fuss about it. The Holy Spirit has brought exposure in my life. If that's what you said I've done, God, then that's what I've done. I'm going to confess. It is getting open and honest with God, transparency with God. See, if there's no forgiveness, there is no forgiveness without confession. So God is saying, if you do this, I'm going to offer you a second chance. I'm going to offer you something in your life. I'm going to offer some forgiveness in your life. So it means that we have to, church, we got to learn how to humble ourselves. You got to humble yourself before the Lord. It is so hard today, seem like people, for them to humble themselves. But God requires us to humble ourselves and to be honest with God and ourselves. See, when we do that, that is a liberating 
act. It allows us to experience the freedom of God through the joy of forgiveness. When you humble yourself and say, God, I've wronged you, it's like the weight comes off. It's like the shackles break. It's like your mind becomes clear. It's when you just let it go and say, God, I'm sorry. So when we confess unto the Lord, it has the power to cleanse us. When we confess our sins, not only does God forgive us, but he can cleanse us, the Bible says, from all unrighteousness. Now, I, I like that part of the scripture. The Bible says that he cleanses us from all. That all steps right there in the middle. He says, I will cleanse you. The promise is that I will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Not some, because see, God has the power to cleanse us. He said, I will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Not just some of your stuff, not just some of your mess. He says, but I will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. See, we hold it on to stuff that God said, if you would just let it go, I will loose you and you will be set free from the bondages of sin in our lives. So he has the power to cleanse us through and through, completely leaving no trace of the sin stain on our life. It is a transformational process that renews the heart and the mind that enable us to live righteousness, righteousness and holiness in our life. But the thing we have to do as a believer, we have to embrace the will of God. We have to embrace the plan of God. And when God is getting ready to give you a second chance, baby, you got to embrace it. You got to say, look, thanks be to God. God, yes, you're going to give me a second chance. Embrace it. See, when God forgives us, he not only wipes away our sins, but he gives us a fresh start. Why? Because he's a God of a second chance. I'm so glad he's a God that gives us a second chance. He gives us a new start. When we mess up, God said, wait a minute, I have something for that too. I got something for that too. Don't worry about it. I got something for that too. If you confess, I'm going to make you brand new again. He gives us a chance to do it over again. See, the enemy will lie to us. He will tell us, you blew it and it's all over. Some of you have heard him talk to you. He'll tell you, oh, you blew it. You messed up so bad. It is all over. You, and as a matter of fact, he tells you there is no room for the grace of God. But there is room at the cross for you and I. There is room for us. God let grace step right in for us. In fact, all of us, we have sinned. And we have experienced a lot seasons in our life that we look back with pain and shame and regret. And we say, you know what? I don't want to go back. But see, the good news about that, God covers it. He covers it. He covers it. But see, it's the enemy that wants you to go backwards. He wants you to think about what you used to be. In other words, what he's trying to do is to rob you of your potential. He's trying to rob you of the better future that God has already made way for you. God is saying, listen, I've already made way for a second chance in your life. When I look at the scriptures, we are in good company. The scriptures is filled with many people that have experienced the transformative power of the God of the second chance. My Bible tells me that Peter denied Jesus three times. But he was reinstated by Jesus to become a key leader in the early church. David committed adultery with Bathsheba. 
and had her wife, her husband Uriah killed. But after repentance, going before the Lord, the Bible tells us he is still considered a man after God's own heart. God gave him a second chance. I think about Jonah. Jonah initially refused to go to Nineveh. God had commanded him to go, and God allowed him to be swallowed up in a great with a great fish but God of the second chance gave him another opportunity to obey him and to go and preach the gospel to the people in Nineveh and when I think about Apostle Paul Apostle Paul persecuted the Christian before his conversion but he was given a second chance by God and Paul became the greatest apostle. And he spread the gospel and the word throughout the Roman Empire. He's a God of the second chance. I don't know what you've done. Huh? I don't know how bad you messed up, but I came this morning to tell you he is the God of a second chance. Huh? When I look back through the pages of the Bible, I found Jacob. Jacob deceived his father to receive Esau's blessing. And later the Bible tells us that he reconciled with his brother and he became the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. He still church the God of the second chance. Oh, the prodigal son, he scoundered all of his inheritance with reckless living, but God gave him a second chance. When he came back home, his father was standing there with open arms, but he had a repentant heart. Then I think about the woman that was caught in the act of adultery. She was caught in the act of adultery and she was brought before Jesus to be stoned. But what did Jesus do? He gave her a second chance. He forgave her and said, listen, baby, don't sin no more. See, I don't know what you've done. And I don't know where you are, but I came to tell you today that he's a God of a second chance. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. He's a God of a second chance. Rahab. Y'all know about Rahab. She was the prostitute in Jericho. But after helping the Israelite spies, her and her family was spared from Jericho when Jericho was conquered. And she became a part of the lineage of Jesus. She became a part of his lineage. His lineage, when you see in the Bible, her name is right there. Her name is right there. God gave her a second chance. When I think about Samson, despite of all of his mistakes and his lapsed judgment, God gave him a strength one more time to bring down the temple and the Philistine, including himself, but he delivered Israel from their oppressor. See, we serve a God of the second chance. I don't care how bad you messed up. I don't care who you wrong. I don't care, but if you come before God and begin to humble yourself before the Lord, confess your sins to God, he'll extend forgiveness He'll extend an olive branch to you. He'll say, come on, but you know what? I'm not going to let you go down like that because I've already made a sacrifice for you. If you would just come and let me know, if you would bow down enough to just humble yourself before the Lord. He says, I'm a God of a second chance. No matter how far, you are away from him this morning. You may have been serving him and going strong. And you strayed away and began to make mistakes. God is already ready to forgive us and to give us a second chance. If we genuinely, genuinely repent before the Lord. I like what the, one of the psalmists says in Psalms 145, verses 8 said. 
that God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. That is the God that we serve. He didn't, he didn't say that about us, but he said that about God. He said he's gracious and he is compassionate. He is slow to anger and rich in love. We serve a God that loves us in spite of, but he requires us to do something so that we're able to get the second chance. So as we reflect upon the second chance, I want you to know that you serve a God that is willing and able to forgive you of all of your sins and to wash away all of your iniquities, to wash away all of your past. God is able to give you a second chance. As a matter of fact, he'll raise you up and he'll use you for his kingdom. He'll give you a testimony of the goodness of God. He'll give you a testimony of his love and his kindness and his tenderness the mercy. We have to allow God's grace to move in and to snatch us out of darkness and bring us into the marvelous light. God is able to do that in our life. He offered us forgiveness. He offered you forgiveness. He offered me forgiveness. He offered us forgiveness. God is offering us a second chance today. And because he's offering us a second chance, he requires us to forgive those who have wronged us too. We're required to be an instrument of reconciliation, an agent of God's love in a world that's so desperately needed. See, the church, we're notorious about killing our wounded. We're notorious about Sending them away. But the grace of God says leave room for reconciliation. The grace of God said, leave room for forgiveness. The grace of God said, go back and snatch them out of darkness. You love them, they belong to the kingdom of God. Go back and snatch them out and bring them back home. I'm so glad that the prodigal son's father didn't turn him away because he's handled all that he had, because he thought he had it all together. I'm sure he thought he, he was going to be able to handle all of his financial investments. I'm sure he thought he was going to be able to do life by himself. I'm almost positive that he thought he had it, that he was going to do it, and he was going to be successful. But the Bible tells us that he squandered the money. He squandered all his money, and then he got down so low. This is what I didn't tell you early. He got down so low that he was eating with the pigs. He didn't have nothing. He lost everything. He lost his money. He lost his name. He lost everything that he had. In, other words, in order to survive, he had to get low with the pigs. And I believe in that moment of him getting low. Oh, I believe God's spirit probably spoke to him and said, baby, you need to go on back home. Go on back home to a place. Go on back home to your father's home. I believe he'll forgive you. See, there is sometimes when God will talk to us, when we're in our mess and we've messed up so bad and we're so low, God, the Holy Spirit is saying, listen, come on back home. Come on back home. Come on back home. I have grace for you. I have forgiveness for you. And that's what he's saying to us. If you're in the room this morning, I don't know what you've done in your life. But I want you to know he's a God. A God of a second chance. And we got to have gratitude and thanksgiving. Church, I don't know about you. I said, God, if I ever just hurt you in any way, God, please forgive me. If I get to the moment where I come to my senses, God, please forgive me. 
And there are times when we have to get to the moment where we come to our senses and then God will say, all I was doing was waiting for you. I was waiting for you to come to your senses. I was waiting for you to come home. So church, the church of the living God. We can't look down on people. We can't look down on them and think we're so holy and we're so righteous. Because it have not been for the grace of God, we wouldn't be where we are today. One of the reasons why we can't win them is because we're looking down. And the Lord is telling us to extend the olive branch. <laughs> Some of you in the room, your family members may have hurt you. Your friends may have hurt you. Your co-workers may have hurt you. But God's word is true. It is a word that brings light into the darkness and he helps us to be reconciled to the Father so I believe that the spirit of the Lord is telling us this morning that he's here to offer you a second